Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to episode four in my series on who wrote the Bible. Today, we'll be covering the Apocrypha, or Deuterocanonicals, books that appear in some versions of the Bible, but not others. This will include books such as Tobit, Judith, the Maccabees, Enoch, Jubilees, and more. It's important to realize that there was never a single point in time when all of the various religious authorities in the ancient world got together and decided which books should be included in the Bible and which ones should not. Instead, the contents of the Bible grew slowly over time, with various books being put in and others being taken out, and with different religious authorities making different decisions in this regard. So, although I've been emphasizing throughout this series that Jews and Christians share most of the Old Testament in common, there are actually a few exceptions that I would now like to focus on. So far, we've looked at the three main sections of the Jewish Tanakh, equaling 24 books in total. As I've mentioned previously, the Protestant Old Testament consists of these exact same 24 books, simply reordered and divided into 39 books. However, we're now going to consider the versions of the Old Testament used by the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Ethiopian Church. All three of these Bibles contain the 39 core books of the Old Testament, but they also each contain some extra books. Catholics have seven extra books, for a total of 46. The extra books are Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Sirach, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and the Wisdom of Solomon. According to Catholics, these books are called the Deuterocanonicals, meaning second canon, whereas according to Protestants, they are called the Apocrypha, meaning obscure or uncertain. In addition to these seven books, the Catholic Old Testament also includes additions to both Esther and Daniel. The Eastern Orthodox Old Testament also includes these same seven extra books. However, it also includes three more, for a total of 49. These are 1st Esdras, 2nd Esdras, and 3rd Maccabees. It too includes the additions to Esther and Daniel, as well as one extra psalm, and an addition to Chronicles known as the Prayer of Manasseh. Finally, the Eastern Orthodox Old Testament also includes a 50th book, 4th Maccabees, but it is listed as an appendix and not one of the core 49. Then there is the Ethiopian Old Testament, which is the largest of them all. First of all, it divides Proverbs into two books, and hence the core part has 40 books, not 39. It also includes everything we've mentioned so far, except for the three Maccabees. So that brings us to 47. But it also includes seven unique books found only in the Ethiopian Bible, bringing its grand total to 54. Those books are 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabean, which are different from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabees, Jubilees, Enoch, 4th Baruch, and Josephon. Okay, so now let's look at each of these extra books one by one. To do so, I'm going to bring up my timeline, which I used in the previous two episodes. You'll notice that, generally speaking, the Torah and the prophets represent the older books, whereas the writings tend to be the books that were written later. This is why I prefer the Jewish ordering. It's not just because I'm Jewish, it's because the Jewish ordering makes the evolution of the Bible more clear. The Torah was clearly thought to be the most important part, followed by the prophets. Most of the writings, though, were written much later, and they are far more literary. Hence, it makes more sense to include them at the end rather than to sprinkle them throughout. What we're about to discover is that the apocryphal, or deuterocanonical books, represent a second set of writings that were written even later. So, in order to make room for their placement, 
we need to expand our timeline to include the next three periods in Jewish history, the Hasmonean period, the Herodian period, and the post-Temple period. The Hasmonean period began in 167 BCE, when a family of Jewish priests, known as the Maccabees, or more formally, the Hasmoneans, managed to win independence for Judea. Their rule continued until 37 BCE, when the throne passed to Herod the Great. By that point, Judea was a client state of Rome, but it did still retain a certain degree of autonomy. However, in 70 CE, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem as well as the Second Temple, and ushered in the final period on this timeline, which I have named the post-Temple period. Okay, so now that our timeline is set up, let's start with the book of Tobit. Tobit is a collection of several stories, set shortly after the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. They center around a couple named Tobit and Anna, and their son Tobias, who ends up marrying a woman named Sarah. However, it also prominently features an angel named Raphael, and a demon named Asmodeus. This already makes the book of Tobit quite a bit different from the books that made it into the Hebrew Bible. It might surprise you to learn that angels are rarely mentioned by name in the Hebrew Bible, and demons do not appear at all. In fact, the only book in the entire Hebrew Bible to mention an angel by name is the book of Daniel. As I mentioned in the last episode, Daniel was written late in the Greek period. Well, Tobit was written by an anonymous author around the same time. This is why they have several features in common, such as the inclusion of spiritual beings with names. By this point, Judaism had been strongly influenced by Zoroastrianism, the main religion in Persia. This is why, from this point forward, we find a much more detailed spiritual world within Jewish literature. For example, more angels and demons. The next book is Judith. Judith, like Esther, is best thought of as being a work of historical fiction. In this case, it is set during the time when the Babylonians were conquering Judah. The story revolves around a woman named Judith, who uses her wit to sneak into the enemy's camp and behead a general named Holofernes. However, it is likely that the story is actually an allegory about the beheading of a much later enemy, a Seleucid general named Nicanor, who was killed by the Maccabees. The evidence for this interpretation is based on the fact that the military terminology, political institutions, and geographical boundaries mentioned in the book all match those of the Hasmonean period, indicating that this was when the book was written. Next up is The Wisdom of Sirach, a book that is kind of like Proverbs and is sometimes called Ecclesiasticus. Unlike Tobit, Judith, and so many other books, we actually know the name of the person who wrote this one. His name was Joshua ben Sirach, or Jesus ben Sirach, hence the title Sirach. We also know exactly when he wrote it because he mentions the name of the high priest at the time, Simon II. This puts it right at the end of the Greek period, just before the Hasmonean takeover. We also know that a prologue was added to the book several decades later by his grandson, and this prologue is particularly helpful in understanding how and when the Jewish canon was formed, because it contains the earliest mention of the tripartite division of the Tanakh, Sirach chapter 1 verse 1 reads, Many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the others that followed them. Moving on, let's now consider the book of Baruch. According to the book of Jeremiah, Baruch was the prophet Jeremiah's scribe. That would mean that he lived around the time of the Babylonian exile. However, due to the language used in the book, it is unlikely that Baruch actually wrote Baruch. As is often the case, it is more likely that a later, anonymous writer simply wrote the book as if it was written by Baruch. 
And although the book deals with the loss of the temple due to the Babylonians, it is likely that what it is really talking about is the loss of the temple that occurred just prior to the Maccabean Revolt. This would place its composition around the same time as Judith. Next is the Book of Wisdom, also known as the Wisdom of Solomon, another Proverbs-like book that was supposedly written by King Solomon, but almost certainly was written much later, probably around the same time as Baruch. Based on an analysis of the grammar and vocabulary used, Baruch and Wisdom are thought to be the two earliest books on this chart to have been originally written in Greek. This is in contrast to Tobit and Sirach and perhaps Judith, which were originally written in Hebrew and only later translated to Greek. We know this partly because Hebrew fragments of both Tobit and Sirach were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The final two books in the Apocrypha are 1st and 2nd Maccabees. However, please note that these two books are not a part one and part two. Instead, they are two different versions of the same events, written by two different authors. 1st Maccabees was originally written in Hebrew by someone living in Judea, whereas 2nd Maccabees was written in Greek by someone living in Alexandria, Egypt. Both were written around 100 BCE. We do not know the name of either author. However, 2nd Maccabees is supposedly a condensed version of a now lost five-book series about the Maccabees, written by a man named Jason of Cyrene. The Maccabees are, of course, associated with the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. However, please note that the miracle of the oil story is actually not mentioned in either 1st or 2nd Maccabees. The earliest mention of that part of the Hanukkah story is actually in the Talmud. Anyway, if you want to learn more about the Maccabees and the Hasmonean period from a historical point of view, I'd recommend watching the video on this channel where we go through their family tree. I'll link to that in the description. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the Apocrypha also includes several additions to Esther and Daniel. In other words, the Greek versions of those two books are longer than the original Hebrew versions because at some point, someone added some bonus material, probably written in Greek from the start, and added around 100 BCE. In the case of Esther, the additions are sprinkled throughout and end up changing the tone of the entire work from that of a comedy to that of a more serious tale. In contrast, the additions to Daniel consist of three large chunks. The prayer of Azariah, which is part of the fiery furnace story. Susanna and the elders, a story about two creepy old men sexually harassing a woman. And Bell and the dragon, which is actually two stories. One about corrupt priests and one about Daniel slaying a dragon. So that takes care of all the Catholic deuterocanonical books called the Apocrypha by Protestants. However, as I mentioned, the Eastern Orthodox and Ethiopian Bibles include several more books. Let's start with 1st and 2nd Esdras. Again, these are not a part one and part two, but rather two totally different books by two totally different authors. The first thing you need to know is that Esdras is simply the Greek version of the name Ezra. And we already have a book of Ezra, as well as a book of Nehemiah, which in the original Jewish Bible was considered to be a part of the book of Ezra. First, Esdras is basically a Greek version of the original book of Ezra, with some changes. Written in the late Hasmonean or early Herodian period. Second Esdras, however, is something totally different. It was written in Latin after the rise of Christianity and falls into the category of apocalyptic literature. Next is 3rd and 4th Maccabees. 3rd Maccabees actually has nothing to do with the Maccabees. It's a story about Ptolemy IV's persecution of the Jews about 40 years prior to the rise of the Maccabees. 
It was written in Greek around the same time as 1st Esdras. 4th Maccabees is kind of a commentary on 2nd Maccabees. It too was written in Greek, but much later, around the same time as 2nd Esdras. That takes care of everything included in the Eastern Orthodox Bible, which leaves us with the books that are found only in the Ethiopian Bible. Let's start with the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabean. Although the name derives from the word Maccabee, these Ethiopian books are totally different from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabees. For one thing, they are written in Ge'ez, which is the ancient language of Ethiopia. The first two do appear to be loosely based on the Maccabees, but with the names and locations in the story changed significantly. For example, the evil king in the Ethiopian version is a man named Sirut Saidan. Interestingly, coins of Antiochus IV, the villain in the original story, often included the city names Tyre and Sidon, which could be where the name Sirut Saidan comes from. Third Maccabean, however, has nothing to do with the Maccabees and instead focuses on Bible characters such as Adam and David. All three of the Ethiopian Maccabees were likely written very late in the post-temple period, almost as late as the fall of the Western Roman Empire. We then have Fourth Baruch, which is designated as such because there is also a second Baruch and a third Baruch, even though neither of them ended up being included in any Bible. Anyhow, Fourth Baruch was likely written in Greek sometime in the post-temple period. However, Josephon was written much later than anything we've seen so far. In fact, it was probably written in Italy, well into the Middle Ages, even though it was written in Hebrew, and its name comes from the fact that it was said to have been written by Josephus. It's kind of a recap of Jewish history, but because it was written so late, I'm going to place it completely off the chart. In contrast, the Book of Jubilees, which was also originally written in Hebrew, was composed much earlier, likely around the same time as 1st and 2nd Maccabees, which is why fragments of it have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's kind of an alternative Book of Genesis, and in fact is sometimes called Leptogenesis, meaning the Lesser Genesis. It centers around the idea of the Jubilee Cycle a concept from the Torah in which the land is given rest every seven years, and then after seven cycles of seven, there is a special jubilee year. According to the book of Jubilees, the exodus from Egypt occurred in the 2451st year after the creation of the world. 50 multiplied by 49 equals 2450 which means that the exodus occurred at the start of the 50th set of 50 years, making it a jubilee of jubilees. I'll be returning to this calculation in September, when I plan to do a video on the Jewish calendar. Okay, last but not least is the Book of Enoch, which in my opinion is the most interesting of all the apocryphal books. It takes its name from a minor Bible character named Enoch, who shows up on the genealogy between Adam and Noah. In Islam, this character is known as Idris. However, the book of Enoch was obviously not written by Enoch. It was written during the Greek period. And one of the things that makes it so interesting is the fact that parts of it are likely older than Daniel. Daniel being the last book that made it into the Tanakh. So basically, every other apocryphal book except Enoch was written after Daniel, which makes Enoch special. On top of this, it is also the only apocryphal book that is referenced in the New Testament. In fact, it's referenced seven times in these verses. Finally, I should also point out that several Hebrew and Aramaic fragments of the Book of Enoch have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, the most important thing you need to know about the Book of Enoch is that it's actually five 
books, and that each book was likely written by a different author at a different time. There's the Book of Watchers, the Book of Parables, the Book of Astronomy, the Book of Dreams, and the Epistle of Enoch. The oldest section is the Book of Watchers. This is the part that was likely written in the Greek period, before the Book of Daniel, whereas the latest section is the Book of Parables, written during the post-Temple period. I'm going to focus on the Book of Watchers because that's the part that tends to come up the most when people talk about the Book of Enoch. The whole thing is basically based on a few short verses in Genesis that go like this. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground, the sons of God saw they were fair, and they took wives for themselves. The Nephilim were on earth in those days, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men, who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and the Lord was sorry that he made mankind. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created. Genesis 6, 1-7, New Revised Standard Version. What follows is the flood story. So it seems that these few somewhat puzzling verses that read more like pagan mythology than the rest of the Bible are given as the explanation for the flood. Well, according to the book of Enoch, the phrase sons of God refers to a special group of angels called the watchers, whose job was to watch over the newly created humans. The book of Enoch basically fleshes out the Genesis account and describes how fallen angels end up having sex with human women, resulting in a race of giants known as the Nephilim. As I mentioned earlier, the Tanakh doesn't really give much information about angels or fallen angels, but the book of Enoch does. It lists the names of many angelic beings, such as Samyaza, the leader of the Watchers, Azazel, the fallen angel who teaches humans to use metal and to make weapons, and Uriel, one of the good archangels who acts as Enoch's guide. So if the book of Enoch includes so much extra information, why then did it not make it into the Jewish Bible? To explain, I need to tell you a bit more about what was happening during the Greek period of Jewish history. In episode 1, I put forward the idea that the ancient Israelites were originally two separate kingdoms with two separate origin stories, one that involved Moses and one that involved the three patriarchs, and that it wasn't until after the fall of the northern kingdom that the idea of monotheism really took off, when most of the northerners fled south and joined the kingdom of Judah, to create a unified state and a unified religion. This religion, which can be called First Temple Judaism, was short-lived because not too long after it got going, the First Temple was destroyed and the elite were exiled to Babylon. But as you're hopefully aware of by this point, the Jews were eventually allowed by the Persians to return and rebuild their temple. It is probably sometime during this period that the two origin stories were combined for the first time, and that the final version of the Torah was compiled, creating a new religion that could be called Second Temple Judaism. However, over the next several hundred years, particularly by the time that the Persians were replaced by the Greeks, several different groups emerged within Second Temple Judaism, each with their own slightly different understanding of the religion. The three main groups were the Pharisees, who were mainly scribes and teachers, the Sadducees, who were the priests, and the Essenes, who were the most mystical of the three. When the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE, the Sadducees basically disappeared because there was no longer a temple for them to use. At this point, the very bookish Pharisees ended up redefining Judaism, and it eventually evolved into Rabbinical Judaism, which is the type of Judaism that exists to this day. The Essenes 
are the group that we know the least about. They may or may not have been the ones responsible for making the Dead Sea Scrolls. These days, there's some debate about that. However, one idea is that they were the ones who were the most interested in stuff like angels and demons and a future messiah. Because of this, some scholars have put forward the idea that the Essenes might have had a strong influence on the development of Christianity. So by the time that the biblical canon was finalized, which was sometime after 70 CE, Second Temple Judaism no longer existed, and instead there were two main descendants left behind. On one hand, there was Rabbinical Judaism, and on the other hand, early Christianity. The rabbis, as the direct descendants of the Pharisees, were more concerned with the Torah and less concerned with later writings, such as the Book of Enoch. In fact, the early rabbis interpreted Genesis 6 very differently than the way that the Book of Enoch does. They taught that the phrase, the sons of God, which can also be translated as the sons of the powerful ones, did not refer to spiritual beings at all, but rather referred to some kind of noble line of humans that became corrupt. So, The rabbis did not include Enoch in the Jewish Tanakh. The early Christians, on the other hand, seemed to hold on to the book of Enoch a little longer. For example, 3rd century church fathers such as Tertullian and Origen both considered it to be divinely inspired. However, in 382 CE at the Council of Rome, it did not make the final cut when the contents of the Catholic Bible were finally set in stone. Of course, it did remain in the Ethiopian Bible, which is why it did make it into this video. So that completes our look at the Jewish Bible as well as the Apocrypha, which means that, starting with the next episode, we'll be moving into the New Testament. You can find the full schedule in the description. Thanks for watching.